Good evening. Welcome to Thursday Book Club. It's delightful to be here today. Um, I'm coming to you as normally I am, except for last week, from Gadigal Land, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. For anyone new watching either now or um, or later, uh, my name is Suzanne Leal. I'm the author of five books, most recently The Watchful Wife and Running with Ivan. As our cohort here tonight can attest, um, Thursday Book Club's been going on since um, COVID, mm -hmm. so since 2020, when um, when really it was an idea to try, for me to try and bring readers together. And quite frankly, I had a book that came out the day of the lockdown and it seemed a way to, to do something, I think. Three years later, we're, um, we're going strong. And um, last week was one of an, ex an exciting part for me because I was in Geelong and I saw Nola, who's um, been a regular meter, me 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 book cup cover, and um, it was wonderful to see her in person. So um, that's terrific. Uh, we have a, a writer that I interview once a month, and tonight, to my delight, it's Lucy Campbell, who is not, whose debut novel is Low Bridge. It's a fabulous book, and I'd like to congratulate you on it, Lucy. Oh, thanks so much, Suzanne. It's really nice to be here and to see everyone. Excellent. It's uh, yeah. So it's, it's a it's a nice group we've got. Where are you coming to us from? It's hard to hard to tell. I'm in Canberra. You're in Canberra. In my teenage daughter's room. She's not here. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, that doesn't look much like my teenage son's room. I think you should be pleased with that. Well, she doesn't live here anymore, so it's pretty. Oh, hard. I see. Okay, okay, okay. All um all explained. What I'm going to do is just read a blurb um, about how your publisher describes Lowbridge. It's a really good blurb, I think. Where everybody knows everyone, how can somebody just disappear? A missing girl, decades of silence, a secret too big to bury. 1987. It's late summer and a time of change when 17-year-old Tess Dawes leaves the local shopping centre in the sleepy town of Lowbridge and is never seen again. Tess's unsolved disappearance is never far from the town's memory. There's those who grew up with Tess and never left, and those who know more than they're saying. It just takes an outsider, of course, to ask the right questions. 2018, Catherine Ashworth, shattered by the death of her daughter, moves to her husband's hometown. Searching for a way to pick up the pieces of her life, she joins the local historical society and becomes obsessed with the three decades old mystery. As Catherine digs into that summer of 1987, she stumbles upon the trail of a second girl who vanished when no one cared enough to see what was happening in plain sight. Her trail could lead right to Catherine's door and then in a town simmering with divisions and a cast of unforgettable characters, Lowbridge is a heart-wrenching mystery about the girls who are lost, the ones who are mourned and those who are forgotten. So whoever drafted that, I don't know if that was you, um, was it uh, Lucy or was it a combination with your um, publishers? It's an excellent book. It was a, an ongoing process with my editor, um, Alex, and it, we just went back and forth so many times. And when you read it in a minute, it does sound so good and it sums it up so beautifully. But it's such a tortured process to actually do it. Like we would sit there debating, are you giving too much away to so say this? And I was, I was a little bit... Um, I probably would have been a little bit more cautious than Alex was. Alex was saying, no, I think we can say this. Readers don't pick up on these things. And, you know, it's such a such a process to get there. And then it's then it's out there and it's all, it all sounds great. Yeah, it's really excruciating. I'm, I'm glad it's not just me, but sort of trying, okay, one, it was one thing to write, you know, 80,000 words worth of novel and that's not easy. Yeah. But I find more excruciating is that you think you're missing it. And then you've got to try and condense it into like mm. 250 words. It's the same when you try to do a synopsis. I remember when I was trying to work out how to pitch to get an agent. It was just excruciatingly awful. It was so hard to do. And you don't know if you're writing the way that they want it to be written. And there are different ways of writing it. There's no sort of set way of doing it. Mm. Um, and you don't know whether you're meant to give away, you know, how much you give away. You just sort of have to do what you can and hope someone, hope it resonates with someone. 
We've got writers um, as well as readers amongst our Thursday Book Club community. So, um, and how did that go with the agent? Were you, did you, did you um, have a particular agent in mind? What was the? I knew nothing about um, the publishing industry when I wrote Low Bridge and I wasn't even sure how far it would get. You know, when you start, especially with your first book, it's all in your head. You have no idea how far it's going to get into the real world. Um, so I had started writing and then I was really enjoying it and I felt like I had something. And I joined the Australian Writers Mentoring Program under James Bradley. And that was sort of the best thing that I could do. He was so good at making me work out um, what bits I needed to focus on, what my strengths were, what I needed to edit, what I needed to, where where the pace needed picking up or slowing down or whatever. Um, and then at the end of it, I said to James, I'm thinking of submitting it to these, I think I had four agents, and he um, said, oh, don't do this person. That's, they're not going to be interested. Maybe do this person. And then he said, um, and I would put Martin Shaw on your list. Ah, yes, yes. And Martin Shaw does a lot of literary writers. He's not so much, or he hasn't been so much commercial fiction. Um, but James said, I think he might be interested in taking on some commercial fiction. Um, and I sent it to Martin and didn't hear anything back. And I hadn't heard back from any of the others either. So I just sent out a follow-up email. It's like so waiting for a date. It's like when before we had, maybe it's worse with mobiles. Remember before mobiles, you just yeah. will that phone to ring and it never would. Yeah, yeah. It is. And you just wish that you could get an email saying, um, you know, I've looked at it and it's not my thing or got it. All they have to do is say no thanks and then at least you know that it's been looked at. But I quite understand how busy and unrelenting the pressure is for publishers as well and agents. Anyway, Martin um, went to, responded to my follow-up email by saying, Lucy, you've slipped through the cracks. I'm going to look at it this weekend. And then he messaged me on the weekend saying, I'll be in touch with a contract on Monday. So once it happened, it was quick, but it, it felt like, yeah, that endless refreshing to see if any new mail had come in. Wow. And the, the, that's a good lesson too because, you know, you never want to bother people and you never want to chase up, but these things happen, don't they? And, in fact, with an earlier manuscript of mine, the same thing happened. So things do go astray, don't they? It's um... Yeah, and I'm sure just the sheer volume that publishers and agents are seeing, it is so easy to look at something and say, I'll get back to that, and maybe they don't. And, you know, it was, my... Email, my follow-up email was very polite. It was just saying I was wondering if he had a chance to look at it. It certainly wasn't pushy or aggressive um, and it hit where it was meant to, so that was fantastic. Oh, that's great. He's, he's an interesting man, Martin Shaw. So for anyone who's um, who's got a manuscript starting, um, he used to be a bookseller and um, a very sort of senior book buyer, I think, at Readings in Victoria. That's right. He's German. Oh, I think he's of German heritage and he lives in Leipzig now. So he, I think his list is mostly Australian writers, but he's there in Europe. And um, I was Yeah, just... he's actually Australian New Zealand and he was married to a German wife. Oh, right. Yeah. So that's how he's German. Oh, because he's German. Yeah. yeah. But and he's it's... got some incredible writers. I've got a couple of his uh, who I haven't read yet on my list. Yes. Um, yeah, he's got a he's got a really good mixture of um, Australia and New Zealand writers, mainly. Oh, interesting, interesting. Oh, well, congratulations for that. Now, let's just before we um, delve down a bit more into your publishing experience, we've heard what Low Bridge is about, but for you, what's the essence of the book? What's what's the heart of it all? What what kept you writing? Um, for me, it's about friendships and hope. And I don't know that I deliberately set out to write that, um, but that's what came through as I was writing it. I really liked looking at those friendships between the teenagers in the 1980s time frame and then the relationship between Catherine and the older women at the Historical Society in the contemporary setting. Um, and it just came through those feelings of loyalty and... Um, support that other women can give each other from any age 
Um, and as I said, I didn't really set out to do that, but I was living with, I had my own two teenage children in the house at the time. And um, it was really interesting to sort of watch them and see those, the intensity of those mm. friendships, you know, particularly when they're turning away from parents and they're trying for their own independence. And you just have to really hope that they are looking after their friends and their friends are looking after them because there's just so much that can go wrong and they're not going to take your advice at that stage. Um, so, yeah, that's what it was really about for me, friendship and hope. What I, what I loved as well is the language. So if you, you picture you've got two time time frames, you've got 1987, you've got 2018, and the language in 1987, I haven't heard the word scungies for years. Does everyone know what scungies are? <laughs> if there's any... I did have to explain it to a couple of people. Since those, I mean, for, for, for any any younger people or people whose schools did not have scungies, um, they, they're just like big undies, aren't they? Yeah, the, lycra undies. But they yeah. weren't even, originally they weren't lycra, they were that sort of harder material. Mm. They were really ugly. Yeah. So it was such an odd thing to do and such such an item of false modesty. Like why did we think that people were so obsessed with seeing our undies that we had to cover them with scungies? It was really, it was quite bizarre. They became um, school uniforms as well. So when I was yeah. running, um, like... You know, the boys would be running in their shorts, their normal shorts, and um, I was, uh, the girls had to do scungies. So you sort of basically have these big undies on with your running shirt. <laughs> it was all very odd. Ah, so we used to wear them under our school uniform as well. We've got some comments here. Thank you. We've got some, um, the, the comments are Katrina also called fibs or shape mates. I called them scungies and Suzanne says bloomers for us. Yeah, I liked bloomers better because I like I like bloomers on babies. Anyway, we got we're going away. Um, the other the other vocabulary I liked too was things like um, he's gonna nick it. Like I, I, only when I read your book did I realize how rarely you hear that now. I mean, yeah, people... quite possibly. I hadn't really thought of that. I re I just went back to the sort of language that I recall from my own teenage years, and did it was you... quite easy to do. To do it came back. Um, came back very easily but yeah there's probably quite a lot of words that you don't necessarily hear hear so much nowadays did you keep a diary when you were young I mean that you were able to go I back to did but I wouldn't have them now I mean I always liked writing but I certainly didn't keep diaries regularly so it was it was a memory a memory of getting back to that time sort of uh, yeah, yeah. where you were or, or who was speaking to you yeah exactly Interesting. And of course, you know, when you listen to the audiobook, that that comes out as well, because um, when it's spoken to you, the language jumps out and the language you haven't heard for a while. So it's um it's very effective. What so so I think the um the next step is is the inspiration behind the book. I mean, you've told us that for you it turned out being about hope and friendship, but there must have been some point that gave you the spark for it? Yeah, so I was working, um, I had a job at the ANU and a communications team there. And I used to work there from Mondays till Thursdays and have Fridays off. Um, and I've always enjoyed writing and I've always been in jobs where I've been writing, but um, I'd sort of given fiction away over the years. There just wasn't the time or the focus to put towards it. Um, but on that Friday, on those Fridays, I decided that I was going to get back into fiction. So I just made a point of sitting down and writing and it was all stuff just for me. None of it was ever going to see the light of day. And I was really enjoying it. It was such a good feeling to be back writing again. And then one Friday I was down at the local shops and I noticed on Canberra milk cartons there were photos of girls who had gone missing. And some of them were recent cases and some of them were cold cases from 30 or 40 years ago. And it really just got me wondering about how someone could walk out of a place and disappear, like a shopping centre or wherever it is, um, what the police could possibly expect to find all those years later that might shed new light and what it would do to the people who were left behind. And that was sort of the, the moment for me when I realised I knew what I wanted to write about. And I hadn't considered writing a mystery up till that point either. I just, you know, I like writing and 
I was writing about anything and everything, but mystery didn't come into it until I saw those missing people. And it's interesting too, the book starts with a, a I think it's one page, two pages, which is really um, the last moments of the young girl who disappears. And yeah. um, it gives almost nothing away. We've got no names. We don't know where we are. Um, but it, it's clever because it brings you full circle. So when I came back to read it for a second time or listen to it for a second time, of course, you're you're at the beginning, but you're also at the end. Was that a Yeah, difference? so I spent a lot of time working on that prologue and <laughs> trying to get that balance of how much to give away and how much to conceal. Um, and again, that's that's you know sort of one of the key passages in the book. So um, that was the point where it all starts from, and that's how it all finishes. But we find out how it finishes. The book um, reads easily, um, and you would say, looking at it, that you just wrote it. You wrote from what you knew. But it seems to me that there's a lot of invisible research in that book is that right yeah definitely I don't think I mean if it reads easily that's great because it's meant to you don't want people to um labor over it or to look at it and think that can't possibly be right um so you've got to get that balance that balance right but um every I, I don't have wi-fi in the studio that I write in deliberately I don't need distractions I'm pretty good at distracting myself um but I would make a list of things as I went. And then any time that I was finding writing difficult, I'd come back up to the house and then I could do any research that I needed to do or make any phone calls. Um, and there is a lot because you want to get those details around things like um, domestic violence and some of the medical issues and legal issues right because if people don't believe it, then they're not going to come along on the story with you for one thing and also you want to um, treat it in a respectful manner for anyone who actually has had those issues in their own lives. It's interesting what you've said about the research because I, I think there are you know, a number of ways people go about it. Some people do a lot of research at the beginning and, and won't write until they know exactly what's going on. I think I would never write if I did that. If I, yes, so do I I think you'd get scared off and bogged down in things. Yeah, and then and, and two years would have gone gone past and you hadn't quite got the research you needed. And then I think the other extreme is people who don't research um, but perhaps leave gaps in the manuscript that can then be filled in. And I think I'm sort of a bit closer to that. So I'll write... Yeah until I realise I'm I've got no idea what I'm writing about. I've got no idea what the what the scene is. I've got no idea um what was being eaten at that time. And that will stop me. It will stop me when the writing doesn't flow. When, when do you know you need to research more? Um as I said, I'll just be going along in my manuscript and said, you know, I'll come to a point where I realise I don't know what I'm doing and I will just leave notes to myself saying come back to this or find out. Like, for example, in book two, it's set in a neo-Gothical mansion, which I know nothing about. So I've just got all these little notes about neo-Gothic architecture, you know, that I've sort of collected over the times, but I know I'm going to have to go back there and probably go and visit a couple of places to get those things right so they're just sort of like holding holding paragraphs I suppose just with vague descriptions about things that need to be finessed but if I'm if I'm at that point and I don't want to stop writing or to break the flow I will just type to myself um needs better description here or find out what this looked like or whatever it is and then write around it and worry about it later yeah, I, I've been finding that recently, actually, because I'm writing this um, second children's book. And um, one of the characters was just a bit flat, you know. I, I had the research around it, but he was flat. And it was almost like you just need to write it out. You just need to write yeah. whatever until you find him. Does yeah, that... and, and you might not even find him. He might be the wrong theatre or he might change. I also find that my characters change vastly from one draft to another 
like some of the things that I want them to say won't fit with things that they've said earlier, so then they need to be rewritten. They sort of flesh themselves out as they go. And and how often do you write? I mean, are, are you writing full-time? Are you writing part-time? How does it work? So um, I had been, as I said, I was working Mondays to Thursdays and then I quit my job so that I could focus on writing full-time because it was just so frustrating only having those Fridays to write. I was sort of, you know, I had five hours between when I dropped my daughter off and when I picked her up um, and I just was getting nothing I just wasn't getting the volume done that I wanted to. Um, so I kept that up for about a year and then I quit my job. And then I um, worked on Low Bridge, I guess, full time for sort of 18 months. And when I say full time, it still wasn't full time. It was school hours. Um, and then just recently, two months ago, I've gone to work in my local bookshop for um, one and a half days, which is great because I feel like it gets me out talking to people and observing people and talking about books, which I love doing. And that's all been really, really helpful. It's just enough that I have some interaction with the outside world, but it's also part of the world that I want to be in. So it's not a distraction and I can just leave it there and come home and focus on my own stuff. I don't have to worry about all the extra bits that you always do when you're working a, a proper job. I'm going to just um, let everybody know that we're coming to that 8.30. So any questions, if you could pop them in the chat and um, and I'll, I'll ask Lucy. Uh, in the meantime, um, what I was going to ask you was a bit about your reading. So um, you're now selling books and Dimmicks. So you, you has your knowledge of what's around and what people like to read really um, elevated? Um. Yeah, in certain genres that I had absolutely no idea of, there is this absolutely huge, um, at the Dimmicks that I'm working at, there's a huge sci-fi market and also anime, of which I know nothing. And that is this whole, um, you know, sort of subculture. And you can spot the kids who read it from the minute they walk in. They have very much their own look and they know exactly what they want. They never have to ask for advice. They go straight for the book that they want. Whereas the older people, and being Canberra, it's sort of an older population, will want to chat about what you've been reading and ask for recommendations. And they're also quite a literary bunch, which is nice too. And you do get some great suggestions from people. I'd never heard or I'd never read anything by Dolly Alderton, who's on all the bestseller lists at the moment. Um, and I was talking to a girl, she was about 21, and she came in and I said, oh, I'm thinking of getting that for my daughter. And she said how old's your daughter? No, don't get her that dolly, get her this dolly and gave me the, told me to get the memoir. Um, so it's all really helpful and it's really nice. And, you know, I like talking about books all the time. I could, I could do it till the cows came home. So it's great. So, I mean, the obvious question is, um, do you get to like hand sell your own book? Um, I'd be a bit embarrassed to do it, <laughs> but <laughs> luckily the store that I'm at has got this really lovely bookseller who before I started working there, had um, sold so many copies and she read it and loved it and was recommending it to absolutely anyone who walked in. So she's been such a lovely champion to have and I never feel, I don't think I could go out there and say, hey, you need to read my book, but she will do it and then get me to sign it for the customer and then say lots of nice things. So it's lovely having her on my side. And look, it's useful too, isn't it? I mean, if you're buying a book and, you know, Christmas and what, whatever or birthdays and to have the writer there there and then be able to sign it must be a bit of a bonus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also to be able to recommend other things I think is good too because I, I wasn't necessarily a huge reader of the genre, but I have been because mm. I need to be. Um, and I've found so many great books, including The Watchful Wife, which I just absolutely loved. I thought that really deserves to do so well. Oh, thank you, Lucy. That's that's, that's lovely to hear. You know, there's, there's times where you sort of need, need that pep up as well. Sometimes, you know, yeah. when you were talking earlier, you're riding high, and other times it's it's just nice to know that, that, that your book's bobbing. Speaking of which, um, Suzanne, um, not me, Suzanne, the other Suzanne, um, Suzanne R., has got this message. I borrowed your audio today, so the audio of Lowbridge. Are you happy with the voice? I'm looking forward to it as I love audio. Yeah, I, I can't say I've listened to the whole thing the whole way through just because I haven't even actually read the book since it was properly published. I feel like I've seen it so many times and so many iterations over the years. 
Um, but I've listened to bits and pieces of it and she did a fantastic job. Um, and I'm really pleased with that. And my husband listened to it and said how good it was. So I totally trust his judgment on that. Can I say, just um, from my perspective, I I'm a bit the same with you. Once I've finished a book, uh, writing a book, I, I cringe reading it yeah. again. It's just, just sort of waiting to find a mistake that I overlooked. Yeah. But the audio exactly. what I did when I first got it was I would just randomly open it to a page and then <laughs> read it. And if I could read it without cringing, that was a great day. And then I'd put it away and I wouldn't pick it up again for another few days. And then I'd pick it up and read another paragraph. But I don't think I could go back and read the entire thing. I just feel like it's done now. I, I don't need to. You know, I find um helpful is I mean, the audiobook is really helpful. I found that when I listen to The Watchful Wife, also uh, uh, read by Anthea Greco it was like somebody else had written it because the voice wasn't mine it was like being told a story and I didn't have to work out whether I liked it or not it was just this yeah. woman with this beautiful voice telling me a story that sometimes I forgot was mine and you know what it's, it's good for because when you um when you're doing events and sometimes you forget you know sometimes you forget names or what happens what I yeah. often do is just pop it on 15 minutes at any any given place before I have an event and and it sort of it brings it back and it's actually a nice way it's sort of yeah that's a really good idea I'll have to remember that now um have you got some book recommendations for us what, 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 yes, what I do. You... so I'm, I'm having a bit of an Australian fiction blitz at the moment which wasn't intentional but it just happens that there's so much good stuff out it's really quite amazing so I've got uh Wolf Island Lucy oh, Trill, yes. very good and I know her latest one is out um so I'd seen that and I thought I will read that but I wanted to start with this one and I'm loving it she's exceptional um Another one who I've just discovered, Meg Mason, sorry. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and again, I think she's written a previous one, which I'm going to have to go back to because she's just outstanding. And she, it was one of those books that I picked up and thought, how can I not have heard of this? Like, you know, I saw her on the bookshelf and someone had written a nice little review and she's just incredible. So, so good. Um, Prima Facie, which I had seen everyone talking about the play and saying how great the one woman play in the West End of London was. Mm. Um, and then I read a review that said the book didn't hold up to the script, but I find that hard to believe because the book is utterly compelling and just mm. so brilliant and so well written and so interesting. So that's highly recommended. Um, and then another Australian author who's MJ Highland. Um, mm -hmm. So she's only written three books and I read the first one about 10 years ago and it was just so, so good that I thought I don't want to read another one because <laughs> that one is as good and it will ruin it for me. But then I went back to her again at the start of the year and read her two subsequent books um, and she's just one of the greatest writers. She has these really difficult, complex characters who even when you know they're going to do dreadful things, she just somehow manages to keep your sympathy. Um, so she she's actually one of my favourite writers, I've decided, having read all three now. She's fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're quite new, they're quite quite different recommendations. So I think Sorrow and Bliss we've had, maybe Wolf Island. Um, Prima Facie, of course, is very new. And Yeah, um, October it came out. How, how how the light gets in. Terrific. I'll, that, that, I'll put that in our newsletter this week. Yeah, and I'd say any MJ Highland. Like there's another yeah. one called This Is How, which I think was shortlisted for the booker. Not that that's always necessarily a great recommendation, but, um, yeah, she's just such a powerful writer. Fantastic. Can I say um, before we go, uh, Louise Ryan's one of our members and her daughter-in-law is um, a woman called Amy, uh, Lauren Amy Curtis. And she's written a beautiful book called Dolores and she's got okay. a, a new one out. Um, Louise might write the name of it for me, but uh, it's, I can't remember. Anyway, it's uh, it's um, Lauren Amy. Uh, uh, Strangers at the Port. There we go. Strangers at the Port. Thank you. Okay. I'll put that on my list. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just um, she's very young and um, it's beautiful, just very, a little bit like um, Julia Lee, who wrote The Hunter years ago. So quite, um, 
She's quite. Is it for adults or young? young no, no, adults? no. It's for adults, and yeah. it's um, it's just very um, tranquil, um, but yeah. brooding underneath. So, um, no, that, 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 that's my my work. Well, look, I'm going to let everybody go back to their evening. Thank you so much, everyone who came, and thank you particularly to Lucy. It's um, really nice to um, to meet you on screen, and maybe we'll meet each other in person soon. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for everyone who came to listen. It was lovely to, to see you all. Fantastic. Enjoy your evening, everybody, and um, look forward to bumping into you sometime on the circuit, Lucy. Yes, that would be lovely, Suzanne. See you.